All right, so picking up where we left off last time, yes, for those of you who are very, very observant, I said we'd be back in a few days uh, wearing the same shirt. Clearly, hasn't been a few days. It's just been an hour or so later. I uh, had to run to class, and now I'm, I'm back. So uh, we talked about analogous structures last time. That's what we finished with. Uh, these are things that have a superficial appearance, uh, but they come from a different evolutionary line. And the example that was used here were the gills on this cave salamander and the gills, which you can't see very well, but they're just right under here on the cave crayfish, or these two different cactus species, which are not very closely related at all, uh, but uh, again, have this very uh, superficial appearance. Uh, again, uh, cave animals lack pigment, they lack eyes, but those things come from a different uh, linear structure. Um, embryonic, embryological development also can be looked at when we're talking about evolutionary uh, uh, lines. Lots of animals, lots of mammals uh, in the early stages of development look very similar. Now they don't look alike, but they look similar. They have similar structures. Uh, and this is another one of those things that in the early days of evolutionary theory, uh, some people got in trouble uh, when they started manipulating uh, the, the photographs, you know, the early photographs weren't real clear, so they would they would use a process called retouching photographs, where they would actually take the, the, the photographic negative and they would, using uh, paints and brushes, they would clean up the edges to just make everything look more clear, rather than not as fuzzy and hazy. And of course, then the anti-evolution crowd said, oh, well, see, they clearly, they just created those, they've drawn them to make them look like that. They don't actually look like that. So again, but uh, the two uh, examples your book uses here are skulls of two or animals, uh, the human being and the chimpanzee. And if you look during fetal development, now again, there are obvious differences in the uh, skull of this fetal chimpanzee and this fetal human being. Uh, but you see a lot of similarities. Yes, you see a more prominent nose here and the jaw, the lower jaw is not as robust. Uh, but you see how each one of these fits into this little square grid type structure. Uh, again, not, not exactly alike, but relatively similar. But then look at the skulls of the adult chimpanzee and the adult male, or excuse me, adult human. Very, very different. Uh, start off looking similarly, uh, very different as adults. Anatomical similarities are most often obvious in the embryo, and then they begin to develop differently uh, as we go to, toward adulthood. Uh, again, here are some embryos of uh, some early organisms. There is a chicken. Uh, does it say, sometimes it says how, how many days of gestation this is, uh, but again, it doesn't say. So again, if you're looking at this scale being a millimeter, you see um, that the size difference, even though the, the picture is approximately the same, you know, you're much bigger. This is like five millimeters across. This is probably about eight. Uh, no, uh, yeah, this is probably about eight. This is about five. And this is probably 12 or 15 uh, across. But see, this is a human. That right there is a kidney, in case you didn't figure that out. Uh, but there's a mouse and a chicken. Again, not looking the same, but there are some obvious similarities. Uh, homeotic genes control embryological development. Uh, these are genes, we talked about homeotic genes before. Uh, they're needed for body structures to develop normally. Uh, very small difference in gene expression may make a very large difference in the way an organism grows, either having limbs or not having limbs. Uh, and there's the chicken again, the baby chick, uh, using uh, the four-limb destruction. Here's the, uh, the, the signals. And then here you see the python uh, not going to form. It's just going to continual, continuous, continuously form a tail structure, whereas this one, the tail is going to eventually stop, and four limbs and hind limbs, whoops, hind limbs are going to form, whereas in this one, you just get the front end. Uh, mutations uh, are where homeotic genes 
produce dramatic body structure changes. Uh, these are the antennae of a normal fruit fly. Uh, these are uh, what grew where an antennae should be on this fruit fly. However, instead of growing antennae, this fly grew legs. Uh, and this actually is a fruit fly mutation that can be stimulated in the lab that we actually did this uh, when I took genetics classes at UALR many, 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 many years ago. Uh, this is one of the mutations uh, that we would induce showing mutations uh, and showing that the fact that they weren't necessarily carried from one generation to the next. Uh, this fly right here was perfectly capable of producing babies, but unless we did the same thing to induce that mutation again, this fly's baby would look like this, showing us that this mutation was not even, though it was a homeotic gene, it wasn't a homeotic gene mutation that was carried from generation to generation. Uh, molecules reveal relatedness. When we look at DNA, that's what we're doing. We're comparing the DNA. We take a DNA template of organism A and the DNA template of organism B, and how similar are they? Uh, this, again, we talk about DNA transcription to make the messenger RNA. Messenger RNA then through translation makes a protein. And here's our AAG gives us lysine, UCA gives us serine, and GUC gives us valine. And then that is the, protein, the polypeptide chain or the protein that's being made. Uh, when we look at these sequences and we compare them from one organism to the other, that tells us how related organisms are. Uh, we look at different, oh, let's say different cacti species, different cactuses. Uh, and yes, cact used in the right term, uh, cacti and cactuses are both correct plurals. Uh, if you were talking about five cacti cactus plants of the same species, those would be cacti. But if you were talking about five cactus plants of different species, those would be cactuses. Yeah, I know it's confusing, but you know, it's English. Um, so um, DNA changes are common for many organisms. Uh, there's the tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, there's the T even bacteriophage, just like a little spaceship, uh, rotavirus. And then over here, we got the herpes virus. Uh, law, you know, that, that, that one should be etched in your mind right now, because even though it is not a rotavirus, the coronavirus looks very similar to that. That's kind of the way it looks. Um, so, changes in DNA. Uh, normal red blood cells. Here's my here's my DNA for making red blood cells. Uh, I have a pro a proline, a glucine, and a glucine. A mutation occurred to where where there should be a T right at that position. There is an A at that position. So the T would give me an A in the messenger RNA, which would call for glucine, but the A gives me a uracil in the messenger RNA, and GUG codes for valine. We now have a different protein. We now have an abnormal hemoglobin molecule. So instead of having these nice round uh, cells that look like this under magnification. We have these cells that sort of clump together and glump together and look like this under magnification. Normal red blood cell, sickle cell anemia red blood cell. Homologous protein sequences. This is where we have multiple organisms that have the same um, gene. And the one that always talked about in every textbook I've ever seen is the cytochrome C gene. The cytochrome C gene is a mitochondrial protein expressed in all eukaryotes. It is a gene found in the electron transport chain. Remember way back when we talked about the electron transport chain and the electron transport system, the part of cellular respiration, cytochrome C gene is found in the electron transport chain. All eukaryotes, have the cytochrome C gene. But 
All organism cytochrome C genes throughout evolutionary history has undergone mutations that have been carried from through, gener through generation after generation after generation of a species. So if you take the cytochrome C gene of the human being and you analyze it, you look at all the A's and C's and T's and G's and where they are, and then you do the same thing for the chimpanzee, you find out that there are exactly zero amino acid changes in that cytochrome C gene. So the protein produced by the human cytochrome C gene and the chimpanzee cytochrome C gene is exactly the same. The rhesus monkey, which is another uh, simian, uh, but it is a monkey where the chimpanzee is an ape, you see one difference. Now, here is a very important distinction to make. This says the number of amino acid differences. And if you'll remember during protein production, we talked about the fact that sometimes the same amino acid may have different uh, codons. CAC and CAG may code for the same thing. So while I'm saying that there's no amino acid differences between humans and chimpanzees, that doesn't mean there's no base differences. It's just that the base difference between the human and the chimpanzee did not result in the change of an amino acid. Whereas with the rhesus monkey, one of those amino acids changed. Uh, in the rabbit, nine amino acids have changed. In the cow, 10. Uh, the pigeon, 12. The bullfrog, 18. The fruit fly, 25. And common yeast, 40. So if you will look, this again, this is more evidence of that common descent with that common ancestor. The further you get away from what would be considered to be human relatives, uh, the more changes are made. I mean, this animal is still a, uh, a mammal. This one's still a mammal. But we went over here to pigeons. I wish they'd have thrown a fish in there somewhere to show the difference between cytochrome C genes and, and some fish or a shark or something like that. But again, you see all the mammals are relatively close, but then we go out to birds, uh, we go out to amphibians, a reptile would also have been nice. Uh, and then we get down here to a fungus plant, uh, would all, or, or a fungus, it would also have been nice to have seen a plant. Uh, one of the things you might could do is, this, this information is very easily found. All you gotta do is type in cytochrome C differences between humans and roses, and it's out there. It's very easily found. I just wish this chart had have included, uh, uh, you know, a reptile, a fish, and a plant as well. Um, molecular clocks. We look at um, different, very similar species. Uh, just so happens we're looking here at a couple of different uh, lemurs. Uh, if you watch, uh, I think it's on the Disney Channel, maybe, uh, or maybe one of those other kids' uh, TV channels. There's a show called All Hail King Julian. Uh, King Julian. Uh, he was also in the Madagascar movies and the, um, uh, uh, yeah, the one with the lion where they, they shipped him from the New York Zoo. Uh, yeah, Madagascar, I think is the name of it. Uh, but there's, there's King Julian right there, the ring-tailed lemur. Uh, this is a different lemur. Uh, we know these are different species. Uh, we can track back uh, through evolutionary history. Uh, we know that these mutations take place at a relatively constant rate, so we can figure it out. And here's the common ancestor DNA. Uh, here's the changes in species one and the changes in species two. So again, we can use these to backtrack uh, where these animals came from. Uh, how did snakes, uh, and the phrase we use is evolve backwards. We think of things without legs forming legs. Like, you know, the theory is that there were fish and the lobed finned fishes uh, sort of came out on and eventually those legs and limbs got stronger and stronger and through stronger through generation and generation and generation and eventually legs formed. Uh, but what it appears snakes have done is they went from being having no legs uh, in their ancestry to having legs and then now to not having legs again. And again, we can look at that by looking at some of the fossils of these marine snakes, 
where we see the limb. Uh, it's clearly a snake, but it has a limb. And then you now have these, um, these are the snakes, the bionase, uh, are the, uh, are the, the boas, the boa constrictor type snakes. The, uh, uh, again, the boa constrictor, the python, the anaconda, those are all those snakes. Uh, just, just in case you wanted to know, this uh, Colubroidae, Colubroidae family, uh, that's the common garter snake. Uh, so that's the family that the garter snake in. Uh, but again, if you look at these snakes here, again, once they, once they get really big, once they get up to the 8, 10, 10 feet length, uh, you can see those the remnants of that rear leg. So this is the earliest uh, fossilized snake. It's called Nagash. Uh, this is the earliest fossil snake that we have in the fossil record, and it clearly had a back leg. Uh, we then come forward in the fossil record, and we find some of these marine snakes where that leg has started to atrophy, and it's not clearly not being used as much, and up to the point where it's basically not there at all. If you have any questions about Chapter 13, either Parts 1 or 2, please email me, trussellpulaskitech.edu, or... Uh, of course, the course messenger in course content. Thank you.